Okay, cool. So um, this talk is very uh, related to the previous talk, and um, so this work with Ivan Damgar, Claudio Landi, and by me, Mark Simkin. Um, so we also look at the multi-party computation setting, and I'm not going to explain again what is multi-party computation, but there is like one uh, point that I want to highlight is that, like, uh, let's say we have three parties, and they r run some protocol on their private inputs, and they obtain some output. Now, if we consider passive security, then kind of what we know is that um, all of the parties behave honestly, and if the protocol is passively secure, then they don't learn anything beyond what they like, learn from their input and their output. And if we consider active security, like when we think about what is the difference between the two, well, basically, there could be a malicious party, and he could start sending messages uh, which, are, which do not follow the protocol specification, and from these messages, he could, for example, learn something about um, another party's input, or he could uh, influence the output of the computation. So on a very, very abstract level, the only thing we need to do to go from passive security to active security is we need to prevent malicious parties from behaving maliciously or like from not following the protocol specification. And uh, so this is what we do in this talk. Um, okay, so we have several contributions. So the first one is we show a generic way of taking any passively secure protocol and transforming it into an actively secure protocol for uh, some slightly worse uh, corruption threshold. And the nice thing about this compiler is that, um, so first of all, it doesn't look at uh, the specific way the semi-honestly secure protocol works. So like if you fulfill the security properties that we need, then you can plug it in and you get an actively secure protocol. The compiler is information theoretically secure which means that if you plug in an information theoretically secure passive uh, protocol, then you get an information theoretically secure, actively secure protocol. Um, to kind of give a concrete example in the paper and, uh, of a protocol that we can plug in there is we look at Beaver's circuit evaluation approach, which is very similar to what you've seen before. So this is, again, something where you compute on these, multiplica on these uh, additive secret shares, and you add them locally, and you need to multiply them with some correlated randomness. So we apply our compiler to the online phase, and then we give a specific preprocessing phase, which we can then kind of use along with our compiler to get a full protocol kind of from start to end. And then the last thing that I'm not going to talk about uh, in this talk in detail is we also provide a complete fairness compiler. So what does this compiler do? It, it takes an actively secure protocol, where active security, I mean active security with a board, which means that um, kind of the adversary gets to see the output, and based on the output, he can decide whether he wants to abort the protocol execution or not. And uh, in complete fairness, we have the case that the adversary doesn't see the output of the computation, and he has to decide kind of blindly whether he aborts or not. So we show a compiler that takes an, a protocol that is actively secure with abort, and uh, the compiler makes the protocol actively secure with complete fairness. Okay. So let's start with the first question. Like, how can we go from passive to active security in a black box manner? And again, like, in a black box manner means we cannot look at the specifics of how the protocol works. We need to find some generic way. And there are two very simple main ideas. So let's say, for the sake of this talk, we focus on three parties, and we want to have a protocol that is secure against one active corruption. So, okay? Three-party computation with one active corruption. So then there is a simple observation which is well known, I guess. And so if we take any pair of two parties and one of them is malicious, then the other one is honest. And the other thing that we uh, do is, instead of letting the real parties directly execute the semi-honestly secure protocol, we will kind of introduce one layer of indirection. So the real parties will kind of simulate some virtual parties, and these virtual parties will execute uh, the semi-honestly secure protocol. And the idea is kind of, in the way the real parties simulate the virtual parties, we prevent an active adversary from misbehaving, okay? So let's look at the um, idea. So imagine we have three virtual parties, V1, V2, and V3, and we are given some semi honestly secure protocol that tells us how we can compute some functionality. And these three virtual parties would like to run these proto uh, this protocol. So what this means is like, if the protocol says like V1 sends a message to V2, then we kind of simulate this in some way, and if neither V1, V2, or V3 uh, misbehave, if they all behave honestly, then kind of the semi-honest security guarantees tell us that uh, they learn nothing apart from the output and what they learn from their input. So how do we simulate? Well, we let kind of uh, always two parties in this case simulate one virtual party. So for example, in this case, we have um, P2 and P the real parties P2 and P3 simulate the virtual party V1, okay? And uh, then we do this kind of for all of them. 
And what you can already observe here is that um, every real party simulates two virtual parties, okay? So for example, we have the p real party P2, it simulates V1, and it simulates uh, the real party V3, okay? And what do they do to simulate? Let's for the moment assume that somehow the, the, for example, the real parties in V1, let's say P2 and P2, somehow they already agreed on an input and they already agreed on a random tape that uh, they want to use for the computation. So if they have the same input and if they have the same uh, random tape and they run the same protocol, then they, always, uh, they, then they can always send the identical message. So what we then do is kind of, let's say, V1 should send a message to V3 in the protocol execution of the semi honestly secure protocol, then we will let P2 and P3 send a message to each P1 and P2. So P1 in this case will receive a message from P2 and P3, and uh, P2 will also receive a message from P2 and P3. Like, it doesn't make sense that P2 sends a message to P2, but like, you get the point. Um, so now that, let's say, P1 receives two messages, and um, we know that we, have, we want to be secure against one act of corruption. So what does that mean? That means if the adversary misbehaved, then he will not be consistent with the other honest party, because he can either behave honestly, then the two messages that the party receives are the same, or if one party misbehaves, then the two messages uh, a receiving party receives are not the same. And in this case, the party can abort, and it do doesn't respond to a maliciously formed message. So this is the idea of the protocol. And this way, like we can see that uh, in this case, we, for example, achieve uh, security against one act of corruption. And now the question is, what do we need from the semi honestly secure protocol in terms of security guarantees? Well, as I said before, like uh, every real party participates in the simulation of two virtual parties. So now, if basically, if I corrupt one real party, then I corrupt two virtual parties. So that means that the underlying seminously secure protocol that I need, it needs to be secure against uh, two seminously secure uh, corruptions, okay? And um, this idea also generalizes. So for example, there is no reason why this needs to be three. So it can also be more than three. It can be an, uh, like an end party protocol. And you can also um, increase the number of corruptions that you can handle. The main point here is that every virtual party contains one honest party. So that means that if all but one part, like if you have, uh, let's say, five corruptions, if you want to be secure against five active corruptions, then every virtual party will be simulated by six uh, parties, uh, which means that uh, if any of them or all of them misbehave, there will be at least one, same, like one honest party that sends the correct message. Okay? Cool. So there are two kind of small details that I uh, glossed over. So the first one is, uh, I said they already agreed kind of on an input and a random tape that they will use. But uh, obviously, like one party cannot just distribute their plain input, so we need to somehow take care of this. And the second thing is, uh, what about the random tapes? So the random tapes, uh, we either use uh, coin tossing for, so that kind of uh, the group, uh, like a group of, uh, a set of real parties that simulate a specific virtual party, they will basically run a coin tossing protocol to uh, agree on a random tape that they will use. And then the inputs of the virtual parties, uh, we take care of them as follows. So let's say I have, again, the real parties P1, P2, and P3, and they would like to compute the function f of x, y, z, where x, y, and z are their actual inputs. But um, now we have the virtual parties, and what we now do is, well, we just simply split, so for example, P1 simply splits his input x into three shares, and then he gives one share to every virtual party. So what does it mean by he gives a share to a virtual party? He sends it to all the real parties that simulate that virtual party, okay? Now, uh, uh, as I said, like an active adversary would kind of corrupt two virtual parties, and this means that he's still missing one share to reconstruct the input, okay? And all of the other people do that as well, and then instead of computing the original functionality, we compute a related functionality which first reconstructs the inputs and then evaluates the function f on them. Okay, so apart from this being, I guess, nice, um, what is this good for? So what we then looked at, let, we said, okay, let's take a specific protocol and see how efficient our compiler gets with this. So we've uh, focused on the Beaver's uh, circuit evaluation approach which requires uh, a pre-processing phase. So we design a pre-processing phase with active security, we apply our compiler to the online phase, and then we get an efficient 3PC over rings. And like, uh, so why is it interesting that it's over rings? I didn't mention that before. Like when we consider semi honestly secure protocols, we can do them over many domains. We can do it over a field, we can do binary circuits, we can do rings. 
But as you have seen in the previous talks, it's quite challenging to get uh, active security over a ring. For example, the approaches with Max, you need to like, you know, do a lot of trickery and magic to get there. Um, but since the compiler doesn't use any kind of Max, if you start with a semi-honestly secure protocol over rings, the actively secure protocol will, just, uh, will work over rings just fine, because the only thing you do is you send message like, redundantly. You, you don't need to exploit any kind of underlying structure over which you do the computation. Okay, so like uh, this I will do very quick because we've just seen it. So the Beaver circuit evaluation approach, everybody additively secret shares his input. Um, they evaluate the circuit gate by gate and then they reconstruct the outputs. So for example, if you have an input X, they will, it will be split for the case of three parties, it will be split into X1, X2, and X3. And one of the real players gets one of those. Uh, if they want to add them, they can do it locally. And if they want to multiply them, well, then they need a multiplication triple. So now kind of the question is, how do we generate these multiplication triples efficiently over rings? And uh, I will only give a very high level idea of the protocol to not get lost in the details. But kind of the main challenge is, we can generate multiplication triples with semi honest security very easily. And then how do we lift them to active security is we generate two multiplication triples which may be potentially incorrect, and then we sacrifice one of them to check the correctness of the other one. So kind of we generate two triples, we lose one of them, but we know that the other one is uh, correct, and we don't learn anything about the secret shared values of those multiplication triples. The issue with this is that if we want to generate multiplication triples over a ring, then this check of sacrificing one triple to check the other one doesn't work directly over a ring. So what we do instead now is we say, um, we will kind of first generate a triple over the integers. So that means we will uh, generate a triple, which is not a uh, secret shared modulo some number m, but instead we will just throw a lot of noise onto it. So if you want to, for example, share a number in ZM, then we will um, expand this number kind of with security parameter many uh, bits of noise. And if you secret share something over the integers without any modular operation, then um, the, the parties can still not learn which value was secret shared even though you didn't perform any modular arithmetic on these values. So the first step what we do is we secret share uh, we use the standard approaches of semi-honestly generating a multiplication triple uh, over the integers with, with these noise things. Um, in the second step, we generate a triple, a multiplication triple, again, semi-honestly secure over a field. And what we require is, is that the field is so large that um, the multiplication triple from ZM does not overflow. So kind of we can embed the multiplication triple from ZM into the prime field without requiring to ever do a modular uh, reduction, like a mod, mod p operation. And uh, then we interpret the triple over the integers as a triple in the field, and we sacrifice the original triple in the field that we generated to check the correctness of the triple over the integers. And why is this useful? Well, the, kind of the, the whole point of this is that now we know that the triples are correct, and we can simply reduce the triple over the integers modulo m to obtain a triple uh, in zm. Because if it's a valid multiplication triple over the integers, then it's a valid multiplication triple in zm. So uh, this is uh, the idea. And um, so we are at the summary, which means I am way too fast. Um, <laughs> so to recall the results, we propose a compiler where you have an n-party protocol, which has, um, let's say, roughly a t-squared uh, privacy uh, guarantee. And then you can generate an actively secure protocol, which only is uh, secure against T active corruptions. And uh, this compiler also works for adaptive uh, corruptions, if you assume that the same honestly secure protocol is also secure under adaptive corruptions. Um, the second thing that we do is uh, we show that you can transform an actively secure protocol into an active with a protocol that is actively secure with a board into a protocol that is actively secure with complete fairness. And then the last thing that I just uh, highlight, like, um, gave a sketch of is we also propose this three-party, uh, one actively secure for generating triples over a ring and then compiling it, compiling it with our compiler. We get a three-party computation over rings with one, uh, which tolerate one act of corruptions and where the computation overhead is very low because all you do is you just send values redundantly. There is no uh, heavy computation involved there. Yeah, questions? <laughs> 